the old guard newly elected. Nobel laureate José Ramos Horta is inaugurated as president of East Timor, but can so many of the same faces usher in the change that Timor-Leste so desperately needs? I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is East Timor. Sixteen candidates battled it out for the presidency, but the people of East Timor chose José Ramos Horta again. The former resistance fighter is one of the country's most prominent politicians. His fight for independence from Indonesia won him a Nobel Prize, but it also forced him into exile. Throughout his adult life, Ramos Horta has faced numerous political challenges, but with the country's oil and gas exports running out, reversing East Timor's economic decline, could be the most difficult challenge yet. By several measures, it is the poorest country in Asia. Unemployment and poverty are rampant, and the nation still suffers political division. But Ramos Horta has promised to unite the country. To all parties, both inside and outside parliament, I will continue to have dialogue with all. I will always go to parliament to speak. My door is always open for dialogue, both formal and informal to work together in national consensus to continue strengthen peace and democracy and reduce poverty and malnutrition. Ramos Horta's inauguration takes place exactly 20 years after East Timor gained independence. But the Asian nation's path to democracy has been a difficult one. From colonial rule to occupation, Timor-Leste has faced everything. Here we take a look at the country's complicated and often tragic past. East Timor was under Portuguese colonial rule for centuries. But in 1974, after a coup in Lisbon, administrative and military personnel were withdrawn from the country. The departure led to months of fighting between local groups vying for power. Then in November 1975, East Timor declared itself independent. Nine days after that announcement, Indonesia invaded. It kick-started a brutal occupation that would last 24 years. As many as 200,000 people are thought to have died as a result of the fighting, massacres and famine. By the 1990s, an independent movement was picking up steam and international pressure was mounting on Indonesia. In August 1999, a change in Jakarta's leadership led to a UN-sponsored referendum to determine East Timor's future. More than 78% of East Timorese people voted for independence. But their celebrations were short-lived. Immediately after the historic ballot, militia groups aided by Indonesia's security forces launched attacks on civilians, killing hundreds of people and forcing thousands to flee. In September, Australian-led peacekeeping troops arrived, bringing an end to the violence, but most of the country's infrastructure had already been destroyed. And it wasn't until the 20th of May 2002 that East Timor finally became formally independent, and Janana Gusmao, a former opposition leader, became the country's first elected president. Well, after so much devastation and conflict, José Ramos Horta is now vowing to take his country forward and even make East Timor the 11th member of ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Now, finding a sustainable economic path will be his number one priority. Right now, East Timor is one of the most oil-dependent nations in the world. When it gained independence, it was widely thought to have enough petroleum reserves to last for generations. But those reserves are running out, and so is the government's money. As part of his plans to boost economic growth, Ramos Shorta has pledged to create stronger ties with China. It is our intention to expand bilateral cooperation with China, especially in the areas of sustainable organic agriculture, small industries, trade, new technologies, renewable energy, connectivity, artificial intelligence, urban and the rural infrastructure. So can the man who's so long been at the top echelons of government truly turn the country's fortunes around? 
Joining me now to debate that are from Dili, Joao da Cruz Cardozo. He's an analyst specializing in East Timor. Also from East Timor's capital is independent policy analyst Guterriano Neves. And from Washington, Gordon Peake is the author of Beloved Land, Stories, Struggles and Secrets from Timor-Leste. Thanks all so much for being with us. Gordon, let me start with you. You know, East Timor has one of the youngest uh, populations in the world, uh, but that is obviously not reflected in its leadership. Is keeping, you think, the old guard in power a good thing for East Timor now? Or, I don't know, is there just no alternative, really? Well, I mean, I, th I think the first thing to say is that East Timor is probably the greatest example of a of a vibrant democracy in Asia, probably in Southeast Asia for sure. And what's really striking is that is that uh, the old guard, as you say, many of them are now in their 70s, including Ramos Horta, who's 72. They've been around for a while, but they're still electorally popular. Um, they've been talking for a long time about seeding the stage to younger leaders, people like some of the, 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 the gentlemen that we're talking with today. But every time a poll comes around, every time an election comes around, um, people still want to sort of invest their faith in them. And there's a good reason for that, because people like Ramos Horta, Janana Guzmao, Francisco Guterres Luolo, who Ramos Horta defeated in the presidential poll, are people that East Timorese still identify as being the resistance leaders, those who took this country from being in the graveyard of nations. This was a country that was had a nine-day-old independence in 1975. If you look behind me, you can see some pictures of that time. And Ramos Horta, Guzmao, all these other leaders really helped clamber this country out of the grave. And I think for that reason, uh, voters are going to continue to support them. Okay. Let me ask you all quickly, if you feel good uh, going forward, you know, following the inauguration of a man that uh, you've known for probably most of your life, his name at least, uh, are you looking forward to the future of your country now? Well, as we all know that uh, uh, the new president, Mr. Uh, Ramzorta, is a well-known figure all over the world. But uh, right now, uh, for Timor-Leste, he has uh, uh, challenges ahead of him. The first one is to help the government how to diversify the economy of the country, which means that uh, there is a need to uh, improve the non-oil sectors. And also there is a issue of poverty and unemployment, especially among the youth. So yes, uh, I am uh, in a way hopeful uh, with the uh, new president because he has proven himself to uh, lead this country from uh, the struggle and getting the independence. But then now is a, is a new challenge. The challenge is to think ahead and how to uh, include the, the youth uh, in the plan to develop the, the country uh, in the future. Right. Uh, you know, Guterriano, if, if I can move forward slightly with you, uh, because we know the oil wealth of East Timor is so significant. But even with a population of just, you know, 1.4 million people, it has never really translated into advanced development. You've got, you know, 30% of, 37% of the population actually can't read, the, the healthcare system has failed, and infrastructure is, is limited. Tell us, first of all, why has that oil profit not served the people? And do you think José Ramos Horta can actually reverse that trend now? No, I mean, I, I would then say that it's, I mean, in the last, uh, let's say, 10 years, I mean, 15 years, we have made uh, quite a significant uh, achievement in terms of uh, access to education, access to health, improving in uh, some of the infrastructure, particularly um, on the electric electrification, on the uh, road, uh, some of the public buildings, building a public administration. So we have made quite a significant uh, prog uh, progress. Uh, uh, in the last uh, 15, 15 years. However, in the last uh, five years, I, we have made, uh, we have challenge, we have faced quite a significant challenges because of the political uncertainty, um, and also because of the COVID. And then uh, we, in the 2021, we had, um, we experienced the worst uh, floods in 50, 50 years that cost around 50 millions of the uh, US dollars. 
Uh, and now we are facing another, uh, uh, I mean, uh, problems with economic problems caused by the uh, war in Europe. But um, overall, I wouldn't say that we, we haven't done so. We did achieve some, some progress, but we, we could have done uh, better in a, in, uh, in a sense. But it's, uh, the, uh, the problems lies in the um, more of a historical uh, problems, weak uh, institutional capacity. Uh, so the good things with the, the oil is that it provides us the money. But it also pro, uh, gives a, an easy money that uh, easy easy temptation to spend. Uh, some sometimes we spend in a in a wrong uh, in a wrong sector. So that has been right. the, the biggest uh, challenge is how to 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 uh, to, to manage that money. Uh, with with the uh, the the new president, they in the semi presidential system, one of the biggest. Uh, competency of the president is uh, to maintain um, political uh, stability and certainty. So it gives uh, the confidence to the uh, my economy to, to function well, and I mean, to, including to the investors. And what, that what has been missing in the last uh, five, uh, five years. Okay. Now with the, with the new president, with the new president, um, uh, that has been one of the, his uh, mandate and he, he promised to, to do so. Okay, uh, Gordon, let me ask you about that because there's some concern now that uh, internal political maneuvering uh, could continue and kind of make this government less effective than it really needs to be at a very crucial time when it's only believed maybe 10 to 15 years are left of being able to profit from, from those oil and gas reserves. Uh, what worries you now about who or what could actually undermine the progress that Ramos Horta is, is trying to make? Yeah, no, it's a good question. I mean, I think that, as, and I'll just follow up on what Guterriano said, which is that Timor-Leste has a sort of cohabiting um, political system. Um, the president, as his, he said, has lots of no powers. So he, um, and it's, I don't mean that in a gendered way, it's always been a he, it could be a she, but there's never been um, a female president. The president can say no to lots of things. So the, the president can say no to a budget. The president can say no to uh, picks for the cabinet. Most decision-making power is in the hands of the uh, the prime minister. So it's almost the kind of flip reverse of what the uh, the Turkish system system is. And whenever there are competing sources of power and competing sources of authority, there's always going to be tension between those mm. uh, institutions. And that's what's happening in Timor. Compound that by the fact that these guys have known each other for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. So you, it's all the the family politics and the kind of personal politics that happens um, in any institution or in any place. And sometimes it's kind of hard for Timorese leaders, as it is for leaders anywhere, to kind of move past those personal squabbles and who did what back then and who may have done something back then in order to be able to forge, um, you know, a, a new direction. But you're totally right. It's um, Timor-Leste is does not have a lot. It's often described as being an oil and gas economy, but it doesn't really have a lot of have a lot of oil and gas. And the clock is ticking. Um, the World wow. Bank estimates that Timor-Leste is about to run out of oil and gas by the end of this decade. Um, a lot of the money that Timor-Leste relies upon is put in a fund. The government is spending that fund uh, sort of with a, with a bit of gay abandon. Um, it recently produced a budget where it was going to get uh, $1 billion for veterans, for those who fought in the resistance. It would only give 0.1% of that money to scholarships. So there's a real challenge, I think, for Timorese leaders, both to be able to sort of set aside their personal differences with each other, and their personal differences with each other are handled in a democratic way. It's really important to uh, to emphasize that. that. Um, um, but, it's, um, but it's also important that they kind of move behind that because soap opera politics can be really beguiling and can be really interesting. But the actual, as Guterriano said, the hard challenge of governing um, making decisions on what to do, making unpopular decisions on what to do, is really what what uh, what lies ahead for for Ramos Horta, who has no powers, as opposed to um, as in he has a lot of powers to say no, as rather than a lot of powers to say yes. Um, and it requires him to be able to work well with 
whomever the prime minister is. The current okay. prime minister runs out quite soon. There's going to be new parliamentary elections within the next 12 months. And then the challenge will be how they can cohabit uh, well together. I mean, I, yeah, I, I want to get into that uh, a little bit later if we do have time. I mean, that's where some are looking to see the return of Shanana Gushmao as well, yeah. um, because he did back Jose Ramos Horta in this election. Uh, if we if we can get to it, we'll see if you know you predict that being a a good partnership or simply too much of the kind of favoritism yeah. from the old guard. But Joao, I want to move on with you. Um, our time is limited, and this is very important because President Ramos Horta, of course. Uh, said that he wants to look toward China uh, to bring in more foreign investment and, and try to better diversify the economy. It can be controversial, as we've seen uh, when China does play a role in the Indo-Pacific region. I mean, do you think it's a wise strategy? And is the public on board? Well, uh, I think the best way to develop the country is internally driven. Uh, that means that uh, we need to really uh, invest in the, in the key sectors like education and also the, the productive sectors like agriculture and tourism uh, to actually uh, provide uh, revenues that are sustainable. And I think a healthy economy is, uh, is only ensured when all the key sectors are uh, producing and generating revenues for the country. Now, if you look at the, the, the history, like uh, uh, in, in my previous articles, I discussed about uh, Southeast Asia and other um, um, uh, foreign uh, relations with, uh, with, with uh, different countries in terms of uh, investment. And I think uh, so far, uh, Timor-Leste has, uh, has relied on uh, imports. Mm -hmm. So if you look at uh, Southeast Asian countries, uh, our uh, deficit is so extreme. Now, if you look at China, and, and I think it's a, uh, it's a very high level of uh, political decisions from uh, the, the, the president, uh, uh, new president side. And because uh, he has been doing this uh, all, all his uh, uh, political careers, uh, uh, what is uh, the wisest thing uh, from the young people perspective is to actually uh, initiate development uh, from, uh, from, from inside the country. Uh, now, I think uh, also if you look at uh, uh, regional politics, uh, a, a small country like Timor-Leste uh, should uh, uh, care carefully uh, move forward in terms of uh, deciding uh, how to uh, move forward with uh, some sort of investment uh, with, with uh, uh, regional powers like uh, uh, or world powers like China. Okay. Uh, Guterriano, I want to get your, your take on that. I mean, do you welcome a greater role for China? helping East Timor's development at this point? Or do you, are you on page with uh, Joao believing it should really come uh, from more internal um, changes? Well, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, we need both. I mean, obviously what uh, my colleague John just described is another one, but I, we also obviously need uh, uh, investment, foreign investment. And we are not, uh, we don't have uh, any preference as long as the, uh, there are some, um, investors from uh, any countries that are interested uh, to invest in Timor-Leste, uh, we would we welcome that. Um, but, but do you ever worry few, when you see uh, you know, week, regional, had... regional players like the Solomon Islands, for example, and the, the turmoil that really broke out there because of the question over uh, China's investment in the country and the role that it plays, does, it could play? Does, does that worry you in the case of East Timor? Uh, we don't want to enter into the uh, regional, I mean, uh, global uh, politics like that. But recently, if you see the, the way we handle the COVID, the biggest do donation for the vaccine are from Australia. We also get around one more than 100,000 vaccines from China. We had we receive vaccine from uh, United States, Japan. So we are open to to uh, any, and that has been our foreign policy since. Uh, 2002. Mm -hmm. So uh, we don't, uh, I mean, I think look, listening from uh, our uh, latest point of view, they, they, are, they have been uh, moving carefully, but they, 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 they still, man, I mean, they don't want to, to, to enter into that kind of uh, the uh, global, I mean, regional politics. I mean, let me ask Gordon if you think uh, that can easily be avoided. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this is the challenge that small states have um, all the time, which is 
And one of the things that I think it's Team Rees leaders do, and there's no better person to do this than Ramos Horta, who, as my colleagues have said, is an adroit, agile, um, political leader. He's anyway, very, very comfortable in the corridors of power and the corridors of Western capitals as well. Is they're trying to maximize um, what they can get from all uh, sort of donors that are interested in, in, in this country and in other places, like you say, like Solomon Islands. So if you're an East Timorese leader, probably you can see there being collateral benefits of this great power competition that's going on um, in the Pacific and in Asia at the minute. Uh, the US is more interested in this region. Uh, Australia is depending upon who gets in, we'll be putting more money into this region. Almost the, the attention of China sort of serves as a net benefit, I think, for many small countries or many nation, uh, nations in, in, the, in, the, in the Asia Pacific, because people pay them more attention. Um, the challenge, of course, then is actually using that money or using that, um, using that, uh, that, that funding and that support in a, in a way that right. sort of benefits. People. There's too many show projects <laughs> where you can say, oh, they put X amount of money into building A, yeah. but that doesn't really let the flowers bloom, just, so to speak. Guterriano, go ahead. Uh, just to give you a context, Australia is the biggest donor development partner in Timor-Leste. And in the last, I mean, during the COVID, Australia is the biggest donor for the vaccine. Uh, so, I mean, just to give you a context. Uh, where we are. Right. Uh, Joao, if I can come back to you, actually, I mean, because, right, foreign investments might have to be an option with whatever conditions might come with it, uh, potentially for better or for worse, uh, because you, correct me if you think I'm wrong, East Timor will have to develop a particularly resilient economy, looking at the challenges it's facing, not least, and I'm not sure if it was you or Guterriano uh, that alluded to it, there's, there are issues of climate change uh, that could affect East Timor in particular, in pr particularly badly, um, plus the massive uh, poverty that you're dealing with, just the basic level of literacy that we spoke about. How do you see the economy really going? Because it's starting from a very low point right now, and it needs, it has limited time to catch up uh, to get to a sustainable level of development. Okay. I, I think uh, uh, the key question, I think the discussion should be had now is how to use our oil money that we have to develop the, the uh, non-oil sectors. And that will provide the cushion uh, for the economy of the country moving forward uh, when uh, oil money eventually uh, eventually uh, runs out. And I think uh, what we uh, need to do is that uh, there has to be a political consensus, or at least um, to, to actually um, develop the non-oil sectors, so that uh, it, the, the national programs to develop these, these sectors continue, even there is change in the uh, government uh, administration. And I think that's why uh, the leaders of this country really, really need uh, to think hard and then think about the long-term investment rather than having have to make decisions for uh, short-term gains. And I think that's why, uh, uh, although uh, they believe that we are uh, rich in terms of oils, but compared to oil-rich countries like in the Middle East, uh, Timor-Leste, uh, almost like a uh, uh, do not have that much uh, oil and, and, and mm. do not have uh, that much money. So I think the question that uh, should be asked now, and I, I think for all the all the Timorese, is that uh, how do we uh, use our oil money to actually uh, uh, develop the, the non-oil non sectors? And of course, this Timor-Leste understands this, but it's a very difficult thing right. uh, to do. Yeah, they might not have Gulf size uh, oil resources, but uh, but yeah, it, it's a relatively small population. So, I mean, Gordon, we've only got a minute left. Uh, I'll let you kind of sum up on where you think the economic efforts need to be directed to get that diversification, bring in whatever foreign investment necessary, and can it be done? So I, I think it can be done. I mean, everyone wrote the Timorese off whenever they um, whenever they were sort of had their independence wrenched from them by Indonesia. So I wouldn't, if I had, if I had any money, I wouldn't 
uh, use it to bet against the East Timorese. Um, clearly, they've got a, a major challenge, which is how do you diversify? Now, it's so much easier to spend money than it is to invest it. It's so much easier to give it to a veterans fund than to invest it in, in education. A couple of things that they are doing reasonably are doing really well, and, and this is an opportunity for countries like Australia to help, is to open up uh, neighbouring economies like Australia to more East Timorese workers. Um, the second biggest source of income in the country is remittances, people mm. who are working mm. overseas and doing well. So there's a lot that East Timor can do, that's for sure. There's also a lot that neighbouring countries can do in order to be able to um, help help this country stand further on its own two, on its right. own two feet. So it is a remarkable it is a remarkable success story. Needful remittances, but while avoiding a, a potential brain drain. Okay, unfortunately, Gordon, I'm going to have to give you the last word because uh, we are completely out of time for this edition of the Newsmakers. I'd like to thank really all three of my panelists so much for being with us on this fascinating discussion and our viewers, of course, for tuning in as well. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time.